unabashed. The most unpredictable becomes a headline. The most volatile outrageous behavior. Unsubstantiated narratives. A battle of personalities. Welcome to Grant Tamasha, a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindu Sun Times. I'm your host, Milan Vaishnav. Rohini Nilakani is an author and philanthropist who has worked for over three decades in India's social sectors. She is the founder of Argyam, a foundation for sustainable water and sanitation, and she also co-founded Pratham Books, a nonprofit which aims to enable access to reading for millions of children. With her husband, Nandan, she is the co-founder and director of Xtip, a nonprofit educational platform. Her latest book is called Samaj Sarkar Bazaar, Society, State, and Markets, a Citizen-First Approach. It encapsulates many of the lessons she has learned in her years working in the civil society and philanthropic sectors. To talk more about these lessons, Rohini joins me on the show today from Bangalore. Rohini, nice to see you again and congrats on the book. Thank you so much, Milan. It's a pleasure to be on your podcast. So I want to start at the very beginning. You talk in the introduction of the book that, you know, three decades ago, that was sort of the beginning of your journey in the civic engagement space. And it, it was a moment sort of born of tragedy. There was a horrible road accident, which claimed the lives of your friends. And that led you to start a charitable trust dedicated to road safety. Tell us a bit about this initial foray into the world of civic activism and sort of, you know, what did you learn from that uh, first journey? Thank you. In, um, in 1992, exactly 30 years ago, I co-founded uh, Nagrik, which means citizen in Hindi, and for safer roads. It was a few uh, years actually after a horrible accident took away some close friends. And, uh, you know, the state of India's roads, it's, there's just, just too many accidents in India even today. So I felt that something had to be tried to at least improve the city roads, if not the nations. And a few of us came together with great enthusiasm and very little experience to try and tackle this rather large uh, uh, issue. Uh, we tried for a few years, but we we worked very hard, but we, I'm afraid, failed rather spectacularly since the city roads didn't get much safer. Um, and we learned a lot of lessons from that, I think. I think it was a very valuable opening innings for a long journey because I learned that perhaps one of the things is that we didn't have enough nagriks in nagrik. We didn't have enough citizens in the citizen movement. And that sometimes ideas can be ahead of their times if the people don't feel the same passion for that or the same interest in that cause, um, then you are, are left without uh, participation. And perhaps that was it. Or we were not strategic enough. We didn't apply enough resources to the problem. We didn't respond to the problem and the scale it deserved. So we learned a lot about that. And then later on, as time went by and I became part of many other organizations, including Akshara Foundation, which was the state chapter of the national and international Pratham network. And then I co-founded Pratham Books uh, as part of that. And then I set up my own foundation called Argyam, which went on to work in water. The big lessons that were learned is work with the people first, you know, see what is the demand on the ground and build that, that demand even further so that together uh, you can innovate on the ground to solve local and national issues. So it was a lesson well learned, I think. Now, the book is framed around these three concepts of Samaj, uh, society, Sarkar, the state, and Bazaar, the market. And these are concepts that you've been talking about for a number of years now, as you, as you say in the book. But I was really struck by this one interaction that you had in the state of Bihar. You were with a local uh, activist named Premji. And he sort of said something to you, I think, that that helped crystallize the meaning and evolution of these concepts for you. And this was, you know, 15 years ago. Tell us a little bit about that conversation with Premji and sort of that the impact that that had on the way you that you think about these issues. Yes, we had gone to the northern state of Bihar, where we were doing a lot of work on water. And our partner, Prem Kumar Varma, was with us, received us at the airport and took us on these this long journey to actually a very remote place in Bihar where um, uh, the local community had got together to save their water resources. And on the way, he told us about his life. He was part of India's uh, big movement for Sampurna Kranti under the leadership of Jai Prakash Narayan. And he was one of his uh, proteges, in fact. And he said that 
the balance between Sarkar, Samaj and Bazaar has been very distorted. According to him in the good old days, Samaj, which is society, um, had more agency and power. And in the last three centuries, uh, actually first the, the global Bazaar became very, very strong, especially, and he referred to the East India Company in India. And then governments became very strong in the past two centuries. And he felt that the balance had tilted away from Samaj or society, and that something needed to be done to restore that balance. And from that, I, somehow it hit me, the way he said it hit me very hard. He was a great storyteller. And I started to do a lot of research on these three sectors and their interplay and what are their roles and responsibilities. And from there emerged a kind of a, uh, society first, Samaj first, citizen first approach to my work, my writing and my life, in fact. So um, I thank him for that. Many, 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 many people have written on the interplay of these three sectors. But I think what I try to say in the book, Milan, is that I, I believe that we need to create the mental model where we perhaps understand that Samaj is the foundational sector. Society is the foundational sector. All of us are citizens first. All of us are humans even before that. But before we are consumers of the market, before we are subjects of a state, we are citizens first. So I want to ask you about the citizen-centric approach because one of the items in this book is a 2015 opinion piece you wrote on the way in which civic activism and civic engagement was starting to turn a corner in your home city of Bangalore. And because of that activism, there was pressure on politicians, on the bureaucracy, and a greater demand for better services, right? So if you think about where we are today, I want to ask you what's changed, because we still see during the monsoon, uh, we're inundated with stories about waterlogged roads. Uh, we hear every rush hour, uh, you know, stories about inadequate transport infrastructure. In the summer months, we hear about water insecurity. As you look back at the past 10 years, you know, has this sense of activism that you wrote so optimistically about, has that been sustained? What, you know, what gains do you think it's reaped? I mean, can you see that? Uh, in the way that city life uh, is behaving today? If we take my home city, Bangalore, I always joke that there are more reformers per square inch in Bangalore than anywhere else in the nation. <laughs> and they have had mixed <laughs> success. I think you can't really put the uh, uh, toothpaste back in the tube uh, because that idea has been unleashed that Bangalore needs a lot of uh, improvement in its public infrastructure and its goods and services delivery. So I think that idea is out there. But I think Bangalore, if you take Bangalore, it is at still a very young stage. Its growth has been very rapid. So the infra has simply not been able to keep up. Whereas the city like Bombay is experiencing very little additional growth. So in some sense, that infrastructure and it's still being built out. Um, it's it's much more stable than a fast growing city like Bangalore. So no matter how much reform is tried through the Samaj and citizens, it's simply inadequate to the task. And because Bangalore, uh, sorry to say, is such a cash cow for the state, the state government simply doesn't want to lose control on the city. And in fact, we don't even have a municipality operating right now. It's being run by bureaucrats. So there's a lot of push. And at a very hyper-local level, our resident welfare associations are very strong. But um, I agree that urban reform has just begun in India, and there's a long way to go uh, for civic, civil society practitioners to work with the government to improve urban governance. It, it's a key task to be done in the next few decades. But um, uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm and there's a lot of participation, so I'm hoping for the best. But yes, we saw tremendous flooding in East Bangalore this year. And, uh, you know, you saw all the memes going around the world about how, you know, uh, these rich homes were inundated. Of course, a lot of the slums and the poor areas were inundated too. But, uh, you know, when you saw these rich homes under five feet of water, it really came out very starkly. And I think there is, a, I hope, a growing recognition that you can't really have a very thin slice of high-quality private infrastructure on a mass public infra that is broken. 
And I think that's why I say in the book as well that the elite can no longer secede from participating in solutioning for the larger public because small private infra is no longer enough. Let me ask you, I was going to ask you about this later, but let me ask you about it now. I mean, this is sort of one of the big questions that your book raises, right? Uh, you, You talk in the book about how in the past, the middle and upper classes have largely exited from public services in the public sphere, you know, whether it's retreating into gated communities, private providers, doctors, teachers, water tankers, you name it. Um, and I'm wondering if the mindset has been changed and to what extent, you know, COVID has something to do with it, right? In the sense that no matter how protected you think you might be, at the end of the day, public health is public health, right? Uh, it reminds me of the horrific gang rape, which took place in Delhi in 2012, where at some point, despite all the private protection, uh, your daughters, your sisters, your mothers, your relations have to go onto the street. They have to engage with the world. And, you know, uh, bad things can happen if we don't uh, invest in proper law and order. So do you think that there is this this change underway? Do you see it? Or is this still a, a, a sort of a pipe dream? The sense that we are all connected has hit home hard, right, through the pandemic. You cannot escape from viruses. You cannot escape from polluted air. You cannot escape from flooding. Um, there are, you cannot escape from the effects of climate change, no matter how rich you are, no matter how many air filters and gated walls you hide behind. So I think that sense that the elite are coming to this realization. And that's why you see a lot of urban professionals, career professionals actually trying to do a lot of work in the service sector, in the social sector, They give a lot of their personal time for this. I think that realization has come. But of course, it's uh, too little and maybe too late. I think we need much more of that understanding to seep in. As I said, that the elite cannot secede beyond a point and that we all have to raise our voices, elite and others, to actually create a stronger public base, a public infrastructure base, so that everybody can benefit and not just the elite. Because otherwise, it doesn't work for anyone. It doesn't work for the elite either. Certainly, it doesn't work for the poor. But it's not going to work for the elite either. And I think that sense is coming in. And I feel, at least I meet a lot of professionals who are coming from the corporate sector into the social sector precisely because they want to participate in this, uh, in this creation of a more equal field. It's going to take, it's going to take decades for sure. But we are such a young democracy, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the things that I think you see a lot in Bangalore, uh, and, and I'm looking at it from a distance, but you see it to a lesser extent, perhaps in other metros as well, is that there is an infusion of people from the corporate sector, particularly from the technology sector, who want to apply their skills and trade to fixing urban governance issues, right? Um, yes. In the book, you talk about the fact that, you know, tech innovation has has complicated the relationship between Samaj, Sarkar, Bazaar. It's created opportunities. It's also created challenges, right? And I think we're living in an era today where many of us are struggling with how do we weigh the costs versus the benefits of tech in our lives, right? We thought this was going to be this amazing transformational thing. It has transformed many things, some for the better, some for the worse. As you look at the ledger of pros and cons, you know, are you optimistic or pessimistic uh, on balance about the way that tech can be used to improve these sorts of urban governance challenges that we've been talking about? Yeah, look, I live with Nanda Nilekini, my husband. (laughs) 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 So there's only one right answer to this question. Optimistic around him and the whole gaggle of professionals and the teams that he brings uh, with him because they really try their darndest best to harness tech for public good, right? And I think he's played some role in the building out of India's open public digital infrastructure. And that has just been tremendously transformational for for ordinary people on the streets, for small members of the bazaar, you know, who are very small businesses and livelihoods. Um, It has been, I mean, India has, probably the best such physical uh, uh, digital infra now with billions of dollars of transactions happening every day on uh, financial transactions on mobile phone because of UPI 
and we can mention hundreds of things like that um starting with aadhar all the way through upi now to ondc which is going to be a uh, retail uh, platform built out for any one to any one connection in the market place so i can't help but be uh, optimistic we have to be vigilant however and that is why i tell all my um friends and all the organizations i know in the um uh, civil society sector that india is going to be a digital country right today's digit uh, citizens are already digital natives so many of them especially young people and if we want technology to be used for good then civil society has to play the same role in the technology domain that it does in the physical world it has to be able to create the 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 mirrors the analytics the whole civil society institutional movement to keep technology from being used for harm just like it does on many other issues in the non technology domain and for that india civil society needs to get more aggressively digital Hey Grant the Marshall listeners, thanks for listening to the podcast. Putting this show together each week is a labor of love, but it takes a lot of work to put out a great show every week. If you'd like to support the work we do at Grant the Marshall, please visit ceip.org/donate. Don't forget to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or on your favorite podcasting platform so you'll be the first to know when a new episode rolls out. So, you know, there's a debate about technology and state capacity and you know how you look at these two variables and there's certain services or forms of welfare delivery that may be amenable to technological fixes and some which may be less amenable i want to ask you about water because this is a subject that you have dedicated a significant chunk of your life to um and it's also an issue that this present government the modi government has also made a key part of its second term to make universal the provision of potable water right is is a is a key part of its welfare plank so uh, you know how do you look at a massive effort like this at scale um which i think anyone who looks at this from the outside says you this could be hugely transformational not just for environment but for public health for education for all sorts of outcomes how do you look at a big government scheme like this and tell whether or not we're on the right track as somebody who's been steeped in this sector for so long no i think it's phenomenal i mean for decades now governments have been working for better water security for our people and for the country because it is such a key resource for the economy as well this government has fast tracked has built upon what other governments were also keenly engaged in and this particular jal jeevan mission the water life mission water for life mission it seems to be on track because the ambition is to deliver uh, running water at least for basic lifeline purposes to every single household in india and of course there are going to be challenges in delivery but a lot has already started to happen and i think it is going to quickly change our public health outcomes because along with the swachh bharat initiative for building toilets in every home and preventing open defecation i think these two things combined are definitely going to do the important task of uh, improving preventive health uh, outcomes actually so the challenges on the ground will be of sustainability of the source of water because it's not like you can pipe river water from uh, to every place so some of the work that argham was doing over the last 16 years and we have been re- our partners have been incredibly successful in for example talking about sustainable groundwater management and i think those kind of things are spreading in the country and because drinking water and lifeline water is such a small component compared to say agricultural water or water used in industry water for life is a very you need hardly um uh, 54 uh, uh, liters per person 55 liters per person per day for your basic needs so it's a very small it's small water it's a small portion of the water and if we can do that efficiently it will have absolutely exponential uh, benefits and I, the process is underway and i do hope we succeed as a country and i hope the government succeeds in actually making those steps work it's that first mile issue always right is the 
ability of the local government, because that's where the capacity matters, to keep that water flowing. And uh, there have been now decades of work on creating village water committees um, in the urban areas also, in the wards, there is enough capacity. So hopefully this one much delayed important public infra will be up and running soon and literally running hopefully. We've talked a lot about civil society and what it's able to do, how it's able to contribute to solving some of these core governance issues. Um, I, I want to kind of turn the question, though, towards this idea of, you know, the ease of being a nonprofit in India. We hear a lot about the ease of doing business, but being a nonprofit in India is not so easy. Uh, you know, you talk in the book very candidly about the concerns you have over closing space for civil society government limits on funding, especially foreign funding, uh, restrictions, or a mindset really uh, that would seek to sort of limit free speech of NGOs. How concerned are you that, you know, there are sort of these burgeoning constraints that the Sarkar is placing on Samaj today? Yeah, it's definitely a little worrisome because I do believe very strongly that a strong and secure government uh, needs a strong and secure civil society to work alongside it to deliver its development goals. I think the work of civil society too um, now is to create more space and build better bridges of trust to their governments. And government is not a monolith, right? There are always going to be champions who understand the need for partnering with civil society. In our work, we have seen tremendous openness to partnership. But I think where, and not just in India, it looks like worldwide, there seems to be a pushback on, um, on dissent, on the voicing of um, anti-government opinions. So I think the work ahead for Samaj is to start building bridges of trust. Because eventually when you see the goals are the same, the ideologies may be different. Everybody wants inclusive justice, more access, removal of poverty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So... I think there is scope for space, but it is worrisome. I do wish there would be more trust. Uh, there were some corrections to be made because in some ways the so social sector in India was not very transparent, that is true. But I think we may have switched the pendulum too far on all the regulations and on all the FCRA things, which the, that is the foreign funding uh, regulations that is taking takes a long time now to get the approvals, etc. I hope this will be um, corrected soon because you see, governments do need civil society. Okay, they need civil society organizations to serve as mirrors. They need them to reach the first mile because even if a government were to be very efficient, it is very hard for them to reach citizens at the first mile. They need those intermediary organizations. Um, they need all the risk-taking capital, you, uh, both philanthropic, philanthropic capital and the risk-taking social human capital that is deployed by civil society organizations. No government can do without that in a developing uh, country like us, which is so highly aspirational. So I'm hoping those spaces will remain open. We all have to work together on this. It's not an automatic thing. I, I find it interesting, your use of first mile, because it's the reverse of what most people call the first mile, right? Your first mile is the one closest to the citizen. Most people talk about first mile as being the one closest to the bureaucrat. Is this, is this, uh, I take this as intentional on your part? Yeah, no, I read this phrase first mile somewhere years ago, and it stuck to me and we use it all the time because it makes eminent sense. The first mile is the place where the citizen who has who needs the state and markets to be efficient resides and if you call that the last mile then you're going to do things for that space last because it's a mental model shift if you think of it as a first mile you're going to give it like Mahatma Gandhi used to say think of that last person first so uh, that's why we call it the first mile closest to the citizen where much of the work remains to be done so I want to transition to talking a bit about Indian philanthropy, um, because, you know, one of the themes from this book is really encouraging, rallying Indian philanthropy to do more, to give more, to be more engaged, to be more risk-taking, and so on. Um, you and your husband, Nandan, have signed the giving pledge, which means you're committed to giving a majority of your wealth away during the course of your lifetimes. As you look at the scene today, 
do you see a kind of revolution in the Indian philanthropic sector or is it more continuity than change? I mean, how do you assess how people have responded to you and others' calls to be more transformational? No, I think Indian philanthropy is at a very exciting stage right now. There are many, many collaborative platforms like Co-Impact, like the Grow Fund and many others that have sprung up. Young, the young wealthy, because there's been such a sudden rise in the wealth of fairly young entrepreneurs. I think they, unlike the older entrepreneurs, are not waiting. They've already started giving forward. And because they are, they think very differently from some of us older ones, um, they are innovating fast and doing things that they're really passionate about, whether it is simply museums or working in education or building, uh, working in skilling and livelihoods or working on um, farm and agriculture, water, they're in, entering many, many spaces, actually. So I believe that that is uh, hugely promising. Uh, there's still more work to be done. Luckily, many intermediary organizations have sprung up that are also helping wealthy families. Like the newest thing is called Giving Pie. Another new thing is called Accelerate Indian Philanthropy. So <clears throat> lots of people are engaged in the space of driving out more generosity from the wealthy of India, because as we talked about before, the realization that all our fates are so deeply linked in this country and indeed in the world. So Indians Indians are generous anyway. Actually, retail giving in India is huge. Hundreds of crores were given away during the pandemic. That remains very interesting. People who don't even have much are willing to steadily give some of it every month. Much of the finding has been very, very heartwarming from things like Give India, et cetera. And um, the rich today, I don't think they have, they can't escape from being philanthropic in any case. I think they are being serenaded for doing so. And they are being, I guess they're going to soon be called out for not doing so. There's a Hurun list that comes out every year. I think more and more people want to be on it. So that's a good thing. You know, it's people want to be on such good lists and they want to be uh, celebrated for their philanthropy. But I wish Indians would give much more, much faster and much more strategically. We need to collaborate, trust each other so that we can work and give together because then it's more than the sum of its parts. So <clears throat> I like to keep these conversations going, but there is a lot of conversation happening in India. And, you know, as I keep saying, the countries allow such runaway wealth creation only if that wealth is going to be deployed for the larger good. Otherwise, why would any state or society allow this, right? Wealth comes with a great responsibility and extreme wealth comes with an extreme responsibility, I believe, uh, to the larger good of society. And uh, Indians, uh, wealthy Indians are being generous, but I think not generous enough. And there are many reasons for it, but I do hope they get more and more generous and give away more faster. You know, if you look at the last third of this book, um, there's a, a, a phrase or a theme that, that keeps reappearing, uh, and it's a framework that you and your husband, Nandan, have been developing for collaboration. It's called societal platform thinking. And I wonder if we should just pause for a second and maybe ask you to you know, tell us what this framework actually is. What are the benefits that it brings to society? Is this something which has broader applicability, you know, beyond the Indian borders. Societal platform thinking, and now we just call it societal thinking, emerged from all the work that Nandan and I and all our marvelous teams have been doing for these few decades, right? Um, in my case, especially the work of Pratham Books, and in Nandan's case, uh, are the whole Aadhaar project, the Unique ID project, and of course his experience in um, uh, running a multi, a, a global uh, tech firm, Infosys. We said, how can we, in the work that we were doing on education, we said, how can we create a framework for impact at scale, which, which can apply across many sectors, not just education. And so we started to put our heads together to say, what is the framework? What is the architecture that can be designed that will, from the get-go, look at what works at scale rather than doing the old-fashioned thing, scaling what works. Because we've always seen that pilots in the social sector seem to succeed wildly. But when you try to scale, there's a lot of failure. So how is it something about from the get-go designing for scale that is different? And some of the themes that we came up with, which we had seen successfully deployed, whether in Aadhaar, whether in, um, in Xtep, or whether at Pratham Books, 
was that actually it's all about restoring agency to people to do things. So what you have to create is a unified but not uniform response to any problem. Because you need diversity everywhere because problems have to be solved in context. They, you cannot have a, a single solution. Everybody knows that. But what does that actually mean? How do you design a unified but not uniform approach? And that's what the team has been putting out. Actually, there is a website called societalthinking.org, which people can look at and input into because we don't think this is the only way to achieve impact at scale. We think this is one pathway. Basically, we're talking about restoring agency. We are talking about distributing the ability to solve. So don't think of just pushing one problem uh, solution down the pipeline because it doesn't work well that way. But if you can enable the distribution of the ability to solve, which is a kind of mindset that you take in, you develop the local leadership to take on problems, you're much more likely to get sustainable change because there's local ownership. Um, there's also for that, of course, you need a technology backbone which allows a lot of the sharing and amplifying of good solutions, the co-creation of good co solutions. So that is an integral part of this. Uh, but it, we always say you have to be technology enabled and not technology led. Because the technology is not the solution, it's just the pathway, right? So these are the kind of basic principles that we operate from. So if you want to reduce the friction between Samad, Sarkar, Bazaar, uh, to work and do what they do best. You need all three to solve any complex societal problem. But you need them all to do what they do best and not try to do the work of the other. So how do you reduce the friction and increase the ability of these to cooperate and collaborate? And how do you release the agency of all those who are involved in that process uh, to continually solve the problem? Because it keeps morphing. The problem keeps morphing. Your solutions have to keep morphing as well. So, Rohini, I want to end maybe on a personal note. Uh, you know, you talk about the, in the book having to battle a bit for your own identity because your husband, you know, who was one of the founders of Infosys, the head of the UID project, he's had so many other important posts. He takes up a lot of space, right? I think is the way you put it. Uh, and you've had to work hard and demonstrate over time that you have an approach and your approach is different than his, but it can also be complementary and unique in its own way. Um, you know, tell us a little bit about the process of, of kind of self-realization and the sort of equilibrium that you finally achieved, because it sounds like it was a process that took a while to figure out. Yeah, no, definitely. Obviously in the, London is hugely successful in both the corporate sector and while working with the state. Um, so yes, you know, and, and in any case, women have to work a little harder to cover out their own identity. I'm not complaining. I think I've been steadily working now for 30 years. And uh, um, the best thing has been that since 2015, Nandan and I are finally working together and hopefully influencing each other's thinking. Um, I'm learning a lot from his architectural, almost systems building, systems design approach to problem solving. And um, I hope he says he's learning uh, from me about always retaining the empathy, which needs to be at the core of why we want to create the better society uh, for all of us. So I think we've managed to become much more complementary. We are deploying our skills in a much more complementary fashion in the last seven years. But yes, of course, I'm very proud of another tremendous achievements um, and uh, uh, been very lucky to have a ringside seat. You know, I have, my work is primarily as a writer or in the civil society, in the Samaj space, right? But because of him, I've been able to learn so much uh, about, about what, what good the bazaars, the markets can do, watching Infosys, watching uh, many interactions at places like Davos, etc. And also when he was working in government, closely understanding how actually the state is your best ally for social change. 
So it's been it's been a remarkably rewarding journey. And so Rohini, just to follow up very quickly, what is it that you hope that you've the imprint you've left on him? Would it be the sort of citizen centric kind of bottom up approach to complement the systems thinking? I mean, you know, you, you describe very eloquently what what you think you've learned from him. If I were to ask him, what do you think he would say? So he's he's gone on record to say that he's learned from me how to always keep the human dimension of things uh, at the very center of the work to remind ourselves why we are doing what we are doing. It is for people and to um, always keep the compassion and empathy and not, uh, because Nandan uh, is a bit of a technocrat. I mean, not a bit, quite a bit of a technocrat, in fact. But I think uh, he's, he says that watching me always talking to people, going into communities, doing some deep listening, then coming back and, you know, trying to work on what people want, what they want, rather than some big idea emerging from my head. Um, I think that is what he says he has learned most uh, from me. My guest on the show this week is Rohini Nilakani. She's an author and philanthropist who has worked for over three decades in India's social sectors. Her latest book is called Samaj Sarkar Bazaar, Society, State and Markets, A Citizen First Approach. Rohini, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, Milan. It was a great pleasure talking to you. I did want to say one more thing, Milan, that this book actually is a bit of an experiment in itself. It embodies my approach to work in the Samaj because while it is available for sale on Amazon and I hope people will buy it, it is also put in the creative commons and is free to download and read and share. So uh, do look up the book Samaj Sarkar Bazaar dot uh, org. I think that's the website URL, um, but you will get the information. So that's also an experiment um, to keep things open and collaborative because the book is really an invitation to continue this very important public discourse on the role, especially of Samaj, but in the continuum of Samaj, Sarkar and Bazaar. Well, we'll link to the book uh, in, in our show notes to make sure that people can download it directly from us. Thanks again. Grant Masha is a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindustan Times. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you download your podcasts. Be sure to subscribe and leave a review to help others find the show. Tim Martin is our audio engineer, and Cliff Jayapranada is our executive producer. Production assistance comes from Nithya Love. Thanks for listening, and see you next week.